Nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. For if the destructive potential which has now been accumulated in the world were unleashed, the human race could well become extinct. These are the first weapons that have threatened everybody individually, no matter where they are. There's no hiding place. There are a lot of things about it that make me just go, oh, this would be so possible. It just bothers me to think that we have all this, this powerful stuff right in our midst, and at any time we could just blow up in our faces. I'm afraid that all the buttons will be pushed, you know, so that everything is heading like this uh, across continents, and uh, then it's just going to be all over with. Any of us could just be walking down the street, you know, doing whatever, and we'd be so unprepared for it. It would just be destruction. Just like a firecracker, it'll be all over. Those who die first and soon are the lucky ones. We would be dead. I'm Colleen Dewhurst. I'm concerned, as many of you are, about the threat of nuclear war. In spite of our concerns, most of us feel that there's nothing we can do to prevent a nuclear war from occurring. Now, it's true. The nuclear issue is complex. But why have we come to think that nuclear weapons are beyond our control? And is there anything we can do as individuals to make our future more secure. We took these questions to Charlottesville, Virginia. It's a beautiful community at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains, not far from Washington, D.C. It's here Thomas Jefferson built his home, Monticello, and founded the University of Virginia. And it's here, just as in any large or small town in America, that people live with the possibility of a nuclear holocaust. Well, I think it's something that you uh, read about in the paper every day, and uh, no matter where you go, you read about it, and, and you worry about it, because uh, that's a lot of power in uh, uh, a few people's hands, and one wrong move, one false move, or something like that, and, and the whole world shot. We've seen this sight so often, it no longer frightens us. Psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton calls this psychic numbing. If one looks at psychic numbing in general, one has to say that a certain amount of it is necessary to all of us. But the degree to which we numb ourselves to nuclear weapons is dangerous because we then are not able to imagine the real. Imagining the real in this case means having our imaginations open to what the weapons really do. And that means destroy virtually everything. I try not to think about it, really, because it's kind of very scary. And um, I, there's a lot of debate about it around here. And we talked about it a lot with friends and stuff. And when I think about it, I get frightened. So I try to put it out of my mind as best as I can. On a day-to-day -day basis, I avoid thinking about the nuclear threat. I think it's something that I push very much to the back of my mind. It's kind of scary and stuff, and we don't we don't really like to talk about it too much. You know, we try to avoid the subject and stuff because it just gets us worried. Nobody knows what to expect at all. And I think nobody wants to really believe that it's going to happen. So people will sort of say, well, I don't want to think that it'll happen. So I'll just sort of leave it at that. For a long time, most people have assumed that just because there's a bomb out there that threatens to destroy everything or almost everything, it isn't really affecting us psychologically. It's a strange assumption that it wouldn't. There's an anxiety which, which overlays everyone and everything and everyone's thought process, maybe not in, in such a, a conscious manner, but that it's always present. I think our generation has been shaped in a way that our parents could not possibly be shaped because we have grown up with some of our earliest realizations of the limits of power of our nation to protect us. I mean, I grew up going through bomb drills and I grew up in the duck and cover days when when we were we were talked to by teachers about radiation and about how uh, we should if we saw the flash we should 
we should duck. And I remember that they told us that it, a bright flash was the sign of a, that the bomb had hit. And I remember being very frightened all through my childhood about lightning. I would wake up in the night, and whenever a lightning bolt woke me up, I thought, this is it. Those sorts of things hit very hard to a kid who has no sense of perspective. But I wonder about these kids who are now in their teens who have never known anything except the specter of an atomic uh, holocaust uh, hanging over them and how it affects them. I was like eight and uh, my dad was talking to me and all this about it and I was getting kind of a worry in my stomach like everybody else does. So I kept every night I would pray to God that um, we wouldn't have a nuclear war because nuclear war can really hurt us. It makes me angry. I mean, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to have to worry about this. I don't want to dream about it. One of the things that I was thinking about was if we have enough missiles to blow up the world 22 times, then that would include us too. For years, we denied the consequences of a nuclear war. We comforted ourselves with illusions. The classical and dangerous nuclear illusions are the illusion of preparation through elaborate evacuation plans, the illusion of protection through elaborate shelter building, the illusion of stoic behavior under attack, everybody cooperating in a kind of Boy Scout-like fashion, and the illusion of recovery which is the greatest illusion of all. In a fictional report known as the Charlottesville case, the federal government depicted a gloomy view of survival after a nuclear war. This report was later the basis for the television movie, The Day After. Today, Charlottesville is one of many towns officially designated as host cities. In the event of a nuclear attack on nearby Richmond or Washington, D.C., survivors would be evacuated to Charlottesville. The plan provides copies of forms uh, uh, for uh, making agreements with restaurant owners and uh, owners of buildings for use of their structures as uh, fallout shelters and a, a copy for us to Xerox and have signed off. On the other hand, the plan doesn't tell uh, any of us even the slightest uh, hints of how we would get the food or, or clothing or medicine or water for those people to be fed through those facilities which we have contracted to use. I didn't realize that Charlottesville was a host city. Um, I, I can't imagine what it would be like. I, um, it would be horrible. I don't think we'd, Charlottesville would be here, or the people who would come here could come here anyway, because they'd be gone too. It's, it's a very um, uh, uh, bizarre is not an unreasonable word to use for, to describe this plan. If one were to make a very general psychological statement, one could say there's been a switch in the American people from denial to resignation. Denial means they'd never do it. Nobody could be that crazy. It couldn't happen. Now, of course, there's still a lot of that around, but people now fear that it could happen. So there isn't that bald denial. It's more, well, if it happens, it happens, and what can I do about it? I think it's out of the individual's hands and in it for the most part. It just seems like as an individual there's not that much change you can do from the inside or from the outside. I don't know. And that, I think that's the prevailing attitude of a lot of people that if, if there's something you can do, you just seem like such a small part in the whole thing that it's kind of useless to do anything. I had a certain amount of fear even at the beginning. It has uh, grown over the years from a slight fear to a great fear and now almost to a stage of resignation. I don't like the idea that I could, um, I or my children would, uh, are, in the hands of, uh, are in the hands of something that we don't have control of, I guess. We have no control over it. If it happens, it happens and just be prepared to go. Living in the nuclear age means living a double life for all of us. That is, we go about our everyday lives, and yet we know that in a moment, everything can be annihilated. Everyone, everything we've ever touched or loved. But we go about our everyday lives as though no such danger existed. As a small businessman, uh, 
you know, that I'm more caught up in the day-to-day -day operations of interest rates and inflation and, and the things that would, you know, affect uh, the economy and my business more so than uh, worrying about uh, a holocaust like this. I don't really know that much about what would happen if, there, if a bomb did go off, but I don't really know that there's anything I could do if it happened, so I just figure I'd like to live my life the way I would live it anyway. If there was anything that I could do about nuclear war, I would. I'm quite sure everyone would feel that way. But when you, let's be realistic about it. When you're out here working, you really don't have time to think about nuclear war. The white train carries nuclear warheads, moving them from their final assembly point in Amarillo, Texas, to submarine and other military bases. Something seems to happen with any weapons technology. We get used to it, and we get used to its dimensions of killing. We got used to doing what's called living with the bomb. There's a broader acceptance, or at least willingness, to contemplate millions of corpses, millions of dead, without feeling the consequences. And we act as though everything were ordinary and normal, just like, for instance, the railroad people in Nazi Germany who never changed their schedules or their modus operandi simply because they were carrying Jews to their deaths and they knew it. And that's why the phenomenon of the white train is interesting and important. The government says it's been transporting nuclear weapons in white trains for more than 20 years. But until recently, hardly anyone noticed. Living with nuclear weapons for the past 40 years, we have gotten used to them. We have gotten used to the idea of mass destruction, even though it threatens all life on Earth. We all fear a nuclear war but we believe we are powerless to stop it. In truth, it is the weapons that are powerless without the human will to use them. As citizens in our democracy, we bear responsibility for the actions of our government. To say we have no power is an illusion or an excuse. But how do we each begin to take some responsibility for finding a way to prevent the ultimate horror, a nuclear war. It's really taking a step over that fine line between resignation on the one hand, or what I would call waiting for the end, into some sphere of commitment, however modest, that one, I, will do something in my life of some importance toward combating this threat and take some regular position and some regular form of action. It's a liberating step to take. People think, oh, it's very grim to talk about all these things and to think about them and to take action about them. Strangely enough, it is more grim and more despairing not to. Once one begins to take these steps, one liberates oneself from that pained conflict and ambivalence about should I do something, can I do something, can it matter, is it worth doing anything, one liberates oneself with a simple yes, I'll try, I can do this much. In Charlottesville, just like towns all across America, people are beginning to take that first step. Our trust, is it not, in nuclear weapons to bring us security is misplaced. Aren't we, most people, only more afraid, and rightly so, because of the existence of these weapons and the rapid rate in which we are increasing their numbers and their power? Instead of feeling more secure and instead of being more secure, aren't we less secure and more afraid? And I have to wonder, can we really believe that God's desire for us is to build and therefore show our intent to use such weapons. I feel the, the nuclear issue, the, the presence, possession, use of nuclear weapons and the possibility of nuclear war is the most vital concern of Christianity today. Several of our members here, including myself, are involved in a uh, clown ministry. Uh, and one skit that we developed we call the, the arms race. Uh, in which we race upon our arms uh, as, I guess, sort of making a little bit of fun of, of the arms race, uh, but holding it up uh, to people and showing how silly it is. 
God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, to open up their eyes. And the clown being the fool is, is there to put a little shame in there, but also to open eyes. Yes, I think we could have a nuclear war. Uh, some people feel that God would never allow that to happen. Uh, obviously, a lot of atro atrocities have occurred in this world that God did not stop. And uh, I'm sure I, along as, as well as a lot of other people, struggle with why God could not step in, why he did not step in in so many times in history. Uh, but he didn't. And I think that's because when God created us, he made us co-creators. We're equally, res well, maybe not equally responsible, but God has made us responsible for what happens in this world. Artist John Kinslow was moved as a father to alert us to the vulnerability of our children and their future. The drawing started off with the drawing of the children. Um, my son on the right and his cousins next to him. The drawing just suddenly became much more urgent um, and their lives seemed to be more precious in this juxtaposition with the explosions. And when I was through with that, I realized I wanted to make it into a poster. I hope to evoke a sense of uneasiness about the situation. It has almost a playful rhythm to it, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, New York, Chicago, like a jump rope song. But it has a, it makes a very perverse turn when you realize uh, the implications of this, that we're not invulnerable to this situation. If it raises the consciousness of someone who may see it, raises their level of commitment. It's worth the investment. I hope their awareness makes a difference because that's where resolve to do something about the nuclear problem has to begin. It has to begin with the resolve of individuals one at a time doing what they can, which is why I did what I did. Today. Waitress Linda Napier encourages friends and fellow workers to openly talk and learn more about the arms issue. We just get to talking about different things at work and it comes around to nuclear war, religion and different things. And it's just a subject I think everybody tries to avoid, but it's something you have to look at. It's just like... If you're on the job, you've got somebody that's over top of you, and you don't tell them how you feel or how to improve things where you work, you still don't get anything done. I've got two kids, and nuclear war is something that you never know when or where it might happen. I wouldn't want to be around to see it, and I wouldn't want to leave my kids behind to have to face something like that. But there's always a possibility, and I hope that sooner or later that there's something that people can do to maybe stop it or prevent it from happening. Shop owner Helen Reitlinger has joined a letter writing group as a way to express her concern to her representatives in government. I was brought up on a farm. I'm not a city slicker. I'm basically a country person. I pretty much stick by the conservative way of thinking. And now I find myself involved and I'm utterly amazed. I feel like I'm kind of sticking my neck out, but um, it's an issue that is something that I just could not sit back and not become a part of. It's too important. I gather information, I read a lot, I've, I join groups that are, in, that are involved with the same issues and the same concerns that I have. I really and sincerely wish people would get involved. I'm not a rabble rouser. I just wish that more people would take a pen in hand and write their senators and congressmen and say, enough is enough. Talk to the Russians. You know, let's, let's get back on the right track. Here I am in a country that is run by the people. And here I am, a person who is standing up for something that I believe and speaking out and going through the process of writing my legislators the way it's supposed to be. And I feel good about that. With the help of several friends, David Brown prepared a slideshow to better inform people about the arms race. I gradually started realizing that all my life I'd had a consciousness about, you know, the world could end. But several years ago, I started thinking about it, talking with, about it with my wife and with friends and reading more about it. 
Um, during that time, I uh, experienced nightmares. I really think it was a result of sort of consciously starting to, to actually think about um, what had been in the back of my mind for a long time. The hardest way to deal with the fear is not to deal with it at all. It just festers and becomes worse. We just can't afford to leave this issue in the hands of a uh, select few in government without giving them uh, our feedback. Since I've been involved in this and, and um, sharing my feelings and experience through this slideshow and talking with others, is that I have become more hopeful myself. Our purpose in this, though, isn't to show the slideshow and to have people agree with what we've shown them. Our purpose is to get people to wake up. Conductor Judy Gary uses what she loves best, music, to raise awareness of the nuclear danger. She directs an annual performance of the Charlottesville Peace Choir, providing an opportunity for many voices to be raised together against the threat. I think one reason people come to sing in the Peace Choir is because they want to stand up and be counted. As someone who is genuinely concerned with the issue of nuclear proliferation, um, I think another reason people come to sing is because they like the music. People are involved in this issue uh, um, who are not fanatical. We don't run around waving placards or whatever, but we are in fact just normal, regular people who think that this should be, should be a concern of everyone. This year, uh, we performed the Mozart Requiem. It has within it all the sort of musical statements that, that you can have in terms of the, the joy of living, uh, the responsibility in a way of it, the fear of death, the fear of dying. The Mozart Requiem isn't gonna change policy up in Washington. But the Mozart Requiem, a good performance of the Mozart Requiem by people who are actively concerned about this issue may make someone else say, perhaps I should think about it too. Perhaps I should do some reading. Perhaps I should become more aware. The trouble is people feel that they can't make a difference. One person can't make a difference. One concert can't make a difference. One painting, one movie. Uh, not any one thing can make a difference. I guess I'm dumb enough to feel that if enough of us become involved, we can make a difference. Just a few years ago, few of us voiced our concerns about nuclear weapons. Today, people from all walks of life are finding ways to educate themselves about nuclear war and express their views. But is it naive to believe that these actions really matter? People do make the difference in what we do in the Congress and in the White House. And although these final decisions are made here in Washington, perhaps, remember that it's out there in all of the states of this union that the reason for the decision will come largely as a result of what people do or perhaps they do not do. There's a certainty. If you do nothing, then it's inexorable. It's all downhill, it's a snowball, and at the end of that long downhill slide, there's disaster. That's if you do nothing. If you do something, if you stand up and say no, if you join others in saying no, there's a chance that you will stop it. There's only one possible way to turn any issue around. It was true for civil rights 30 years ago, it's true in this field now, and that is for enough individuals to keep saying loudly, enough, stop, change. Living double lives. Living with the threat of nuclear war and acting as though there's nothing we can do to stop it just makes the problem worse. It's only when enough of us find a way to take some kind of action that we can make a difference. Action is, is a blessing once uh, you can find a way to move out of dead center and uh, with that awful sense of hopelessness. Change is not going to happen because a few people make the change happen. It's going to happen because we have reached consensus in the democracy. When the uh, our legislators get to feeling that a big number of people 
have developed an idea this way or that way, it suddenly occurs to them those people vote, don't they? And then they do something about it. I really believe that people are going to start dealing with this issue and that by dealing with it we're going to find resolutions. But if we just kind of give in to the cynicism and despair and futility, I think that's the, the wrong way to go. We have to have enough of an investment in this place and each other in a very global sense to want it to continue. It's too early to count out the human race. We have extraordinary imaginative capacity. We have resources we've hardly begun to tap. We have to realize how one-sided we've been as a culture, as a civilization, in calling forth so much of our resources on behalf of making the weapons and planning for nuclear war and so precious little of our resources, including our imaginative resources, for preventing that kind of catastrophe and for preserving ourselves and surviving.